Okay, so I think we're gonna stop, all right? Uh, maybe one more. There are a lot of problems with it. The main problem is a p-value is not really what we want, okay? So uh, what we want is the probability of H0 conditional data, right? That's what we said last time. But p-value tell us only what? P-value only tell us data conditional on H0. So this is what p-value is, right? This is what p-value is. And the problem with judging only based on p-value is we cannot incorporate our prior information. Right? There's no way for us to incorporate our prior information into, sorry, into the data. Uh, let me. So there's no way to incorporate prior information uh, when we form judgment, right? And uh, so, like I said in my, you know, in the WeChat discussion, uh, the frequentist versus frequentist versus Bayesian difference has mainly to do with the frequentist way is to judge everything based on the data set alone. Okay, so you have a data set, and you have to form a judgment about it. So all your judgment come from the data, the specific data set. That's a frequentist way. The Bayesian way is allowing you to incorporate prior knowledge, prior information, right? So we, we said, you know, we, we gave one example last time uh, where there's this research published by a psychologist, Cornell, where he said people can sense the future, okay? And uh, obviously the research result is suspect, okay, to say the least. And the reason why the result gets published is because the p-value is significant. And the reason why it's not a good result is because we're unable to incorporate our prior, right? Now, if you incorporate your prior, your prior should say that it's almost impossible. The, the state of hypothesis that people can sense the future is almost equal, the probability should almost be equal to zero. In other words, the prior probability, uh, the, sorry, the now hypothesis, right? The prior uh, belief of the now hypothesis should be almost equal to one, which means that you should not reject the now based on a single small experiment alone, right? Or in other words, if you, ha if you ever have to reject it, the alpha level, the alpha threshold should be much, much lower than 5%, right? So that's what we said last time. In practice, it's almost impossible to, to sort of, you know, ideally, your alpha level, how much, what is the alpha you should use to reject your hypothesis? Should be based on your prior, okay? Should be based on prior, that's what we said last time. Now in practice, it's very hard because it's all subjective. So in reality, what people do is we still use 5% as the threshold for every research, although it's not ideal. Okay, and we should understand what's the problem there. So today I should begin, I would like to begin with uh, some other problems associated with p-value, or more specifically, uh, the, the other problems associated with research in general. So a lot of research in economics as well as in all kinds of sciences, okay? Um, pub only publish a result if it's significant, right? Okay, so if it's significant, it's published. Right? It has a possibility to publish. If it's not significant, forget about it, right? Now, what is the consequence of that? The concept, one consequence is it produces something called a publication bias. Okay. The publication bias means people research, if you do a lot of research and it turns out that the result is not significant, you don't, send, you don't even send to publication. Right? If you send, it gets rejected because there's nothing there. So only things that are significant gets published, meaning that whatever, re, whatever research result you read you know, in the journals are what? Are inflated effect of the true effect, okay? So imagine, imagine there's some true beta star, okay? Imagine there's some true beta star. Now suppose the true beta star is, you know, let's say 0 0.1, okay? Or 0 0.5, right, whatever it is, okay? Now suppose that's the true effect. Now many people will do a lot of research and they will do, they will produce a lot of beta hat, okay? They'll produce many, many beta hat for different people. Some people get a beta hat of zero and then it's insignificant. Some people get a beta hat, beta hat of one, it's also insignificant, right? Some people get a beta hat of, let's say, you know, five, by chance, just by chance, and it's significant. So this one gets published. These ones are not published. So if you read in the journal the estimated effect, you read something that's truly big, which should not be, okay? The true beta star should be lower than what's reported in the journals because of this publication bias. So let me give you an example, okay? So, so I'm going to what? I'm going to do some gen I'm going to do some simulation, right? I'm going to produce some produce some x, produce some y. Now the, the the relationship between y and x is y is equal to beta star, and the beta star is 0.1, okay? 
So our beta star right now is 0 0.1. 0.1. Y is equal to alpha star plus 0.1x. And this is the true relationship. I'm going to generate 100 data sets from this population. And I'm going to estimate my beta hat for this 100 data sets. All right? So I will get a bunch of different beta hat. Right? OK? So this is our codes. And we produce, so I produce a lot of different beta hats. Okay. Right? And uh, these are 100 different simulations. Every time I would get a different beta hat. And guess what? All these beta hat are insignificant. They are not significant. Okay, so the red ones are not significant, are not significant because why? Because it's too small. So what are the ones significant? These are significant. By chance, I get some really big you know, beta hat, it's significant. By chance, I get some really small beta hat, it's also significant. Okay? The ones in the middle are not significant. Guess what? These thing, these ones in the middle are now published. And only these values could, could be published. Okay, so which, which means that whatever you read in the journals and in the scientific publications are these numbers, which tend to overstate the true underlying beta star. Right? And this is not just a problem in economics. Right? It's a problem everywhere in a scientific community where people rely on statistical analysis to publish their results. Okay? Most prominently, probably in medical science. Okay? In, bio, in biological and medical science, where people, for example, you read all these kind of research where it says, uh, you know, if you uh, if you exercise every day, you know, if you, if you drink coffee every day, you know, it prolongs your life for by about five years, or it has a significant effect on curing cancer or whatever, right? Just, just to give you an example. And should you trust it? The question is, should you trust any research result you read in a journal where it says, our research shows that drinking coffee cures cancer, okay? And because our estimate is significant. Do you trust that? And the answer is maybe, but not to the same extent that the author claims. Right? Because why? Because there's, there, you never know how many research people have done where it shows that drinking coffee has no effect whatsoever on your health. And those research are not published. Only the ones that show significant positive or significant negative is, is published. So whatever result you read, you should always put a question mark and I should always say, think that the true effect is probably smaller than whatever you read in the journals. Okay, so that's, that's one thing that you should bear in mind. <clears throat> Right. Now this is just another graph. Okay, we have we have bunch of we have bunch of beta hat. The ones in the middle have large p value. They're not published. Only the ones in the extreme that's published, and that's called the publication bias. All right. Okay. Now the fact that. Okay. The fact that uh, publication bias exists, meaning that only significant results could get published, which is uh, you know which is an unfortunate. Uh, thing that belongs to the scientific community. That's why many people in the scientific community are advocating that probably we should not judge papers based on whether their results are significant. Right? So there are a lot of people who try to move away you know, the norm in the scientific publishing community towards something that's more sort of commodity, com com you know, does, uh, that, that basically allows people to publish insignificant results. Um, there's, a, there's, a, the, there's another very, very bad consequence that journals only accept articles that, that have significant results, which is the researchers, okay, people when you do research, you will try to, every way you can to try to get some significant results, right? That's even worse. That's even worse. Why? Because people will do all, you know, all they can try all kinds of models and then find a model that's significant and, and send it for publication. And that will, and if you do that, your results will be very, very unreliable. Okay? Uh, so let me show you some example. And that's called, by the way, that's called p-hacking, or data assuming. P-hacking is, is, is the term for people do all they can to get significant results, right? Okay? Now, if you do that, then it's going to be very unreliable. So let me show you something, okay? All right. Okay, by the way, there's a, there's, a famous, there's a famous term by the economist Ronald Coase, right? So Ronald Coase once said, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess. So you know, this data is something like something you know that you can capture, you can torture it, and in the end, if you torture long enough, it will say, okay, now I give you a p-value that's significant, right? So let's see how do we how do we torture the data? Okay, so let's see how do we torture the data. Well, I will torture the data this way. So I'm I'm going to do another experiment, okay? So I'm going to generate some x. The x is called treatment. I'm going to generate some gender variable called male or female. I'm going to generate some y, okay? So I'm going to have three variables. I'm going to have three variables. One is called x. That's the treatment. That's something I'm interested in. 
uh, this is there's a why and uh, I'm mainly, I'm mainly interested in y equal to beta x. I'm mainly interested in this beta. However, I have another variable, okay? Let me just call it uh, z, okay? This z is gender. Suppose, okay, I don't care. Gender is like, you know, male, female, I don't, I don't know, right? So I have these three variables. I'm mainly interested in this beta. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to torture my data this way. I'm going to run this regression and see if my beta hat is significant, okay? If it's not significant, I'm going to do this. I'm going to run this regression, beta 1x plus beta 2z, okay? So meaning that I'm going to take a look at, I'm going to look at the relationship of y equal to beta 1x within, uh, actually, let me do this. I'm going to look at this for male only, okay, for male only, and I'm going to run another regression, y equal to beta x for female only, okay? For female only, right. okay. So for example, suppose this x is drinking coffee. This y is, you know, cures cancer, right? So I run the whole regression, no effect. Drinking coffee has no effect on cancer. Then I run it for male, and then I run it for female. And if for male is significant, for female is not significant, I will publish a result saying that drinking coffee cures cancer in males. Has no significant effect for female, right? I can, I can do that. Right? So that's my way of torturing the method. So, torturing the, uh, the data. So you can see that this is how we generate our data. When we generate our data, there's no effect, okay? Everything is independent. There's the beta should be absolutely equal to zero when we do beta stuff. But okay, just by chance, because we're generating what? We can ge we're generating finite samples. So every time you generate finite samples, you have some, you know, you can by chance you will get a big beta hat, which will be significant, right? So that's that's the idea behind the torturing the data. So I'm going to do a linear regression first. Y on X, it's not significant. So it's not significant. So what I do, okay, I will I'll go to my second step. You know, I'm, I'm going to run this regression for male only, and I'm going to run this regression for female only. And then lo and behold, if I run it for male only, I get significance. If I do it for female only, there's no significance, okay? All right? Now, which means what? Which means now I can go ahead and publish a result. Publish a paper that says that coffee has a, can cure cancer, but for male only, okay? I can do that. Now you say, wait a minute, this strategy is only by chance. I'm just lucky here, okay? I'm just getting lucky that I get a significant result here. Well, let's see. If I do this, if I do this strategy for a thousand different times, for a hundred times, let's say, how many times can I successfully find at least one significance? Well, first of all, let me just ask a question. Suppose, um, suppose I only run one regression. Okay? Suppose I only run y equal to beta x. And I suppose beta star is actually equal to zero, okay? And I just to run this regression, I do it for a hundred times on a hundred random samples. How many times I get beta hat significant? How many times I get significant beta? Do you know? Yes, five percent of time. Why? Because we use alpha equal to 0 0.05, right? And this alpha is what? Is essentially your type is false negative error rate, okay? Sorry, false positive, yeah, false positive error rate, okay? So the possibility that, you know, the probability that when H0 is true, you get, you, you declare it's however significant, it's only 5%. That's what we control, okay? That's what we control. All right, but suppose I use my, suppose I use my torturing strategy, okay? I run this first, not significant, I go to male, not, if not significant, I go to female, okay? Okay, so I do this, if I use this strategy, how many times, on average, can I find significant result? It's no longer 5%, okay? It's no longer 5%. It's what? It's 12%, okay? 11.7, 12%. So if I use my strategy, I bump the plot, right? If, you, if I do not use this strategy, if I do not torture the data, I only have 5% probability of making a significant result. If I use this strategy, I, I, it bumps to twelve percent. Okay. Now imagine that I uh, imagine that I continue this strategy. So if I look at male and a female, n n nothing significant. Then I'm going to look at not only male. I'm going to look at tall male or maybe old male, right? And then if not significant, I'm looking at young male, right? Okay. If nothing significant, I'm going to look at old male in Fujian, right? Something like that. And I can continue and continue. The more I do the more regression I do, 
right, the more probability I will at least find the one significant. Okay? And now the, the underlying reason is very simple. Right? Remember what we talk about when we discuss coin flips in the beginning of the class. We say if you flip if you flip one coin, it's fifty percent you get a head, right? Fifty percent you get a tail. But if my goal is I flip one hundred coins and I just want one head, okay, I only need one head. What is the probability you get you get at least one head if you flip the coin 100 times? Well, it's almost close to one, right? Okay, so if you flip enough, you only, of course you will get something that's, that's, up, that's, that's a head. It's the same thing here. The more tests you do, the more possible you will get a significant effect. Now, suppose we do many, many, suppose we do n tests, okay? Suppose we try n different specifications to n test. Uh, what is the probability? that at least one is significant. Now let's suppose the end tests are all what? Are all independent. And let's suppose beta star is actually equal to zero. Okay? Beta star equal to zero. But I'm going to try n different model specification. N different tests. What is the probability that I will find at least one significant result? Well, one minus alpha to the n is the probability that no, 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 nobody, right? Nobody gives me significance. One minus that, right? This is the probability that we'll find at least one significance, right? And this can get this can get very large very quickly, okay? So when you increase n, this can approach one very quickly. Uh, let me. So we have the numbers here, okay? Now, if I if n equal to five, right? So if n equal to one, I only do one test. That's five percent of time you find a significance. If you if you go to ten, if you go do ten tests, you get significance forty percent of time. So 40% of the time, you can publish something, right? So if you, if you do 50 tests, it's almost guaranteed that you have something significant. OK? There is a, um, there is a, oh, I'm sorry, let's see. OK, there is actually this little website you can go to. This website says, not this one. OK, this website says, uh, if you do 100 different tests, OK? If you do 100 different tests, uh, at a single time, okay. How many? How many can you publish? Well, let's try. Okay, try. So this is random, right? So you see, okay, now significant, now significant, significant publish. Okay, now significant, now significant, significant publish. So every time there's significant publish, you can publish because it's significant, right? So if you do, the idea is if you do enough tests, in the end you always get something. Okay, torture the data enough, they confess. Right? Okay. So. Uh, now that we know it's a bad idea, okay, this is called a p-hacking, or it's called a specification search, meaning you're always searching for the specification that works, okay, that gives you significance. Now that we know it's a bad idea, what can we do about it? Okay. Well, what we can do is, some people have said that what we can do is called Bonferroni correction. Okay. So what is Bonferroni correction? The idea is very simple. So I want what? I want to control, so the idea is I want to control my false positive rate at only 5%, right? That's what I want to control, type 1 error at 5%. So if I only do one test, right, that's 5%, that's good. Now what I'm saying is if I do 10 tests, then that's a, you know, then that's a very big number. So what can I do? Well, I change my alpha for each test. So if I only do one test, my alpha is my alpha is 0 0.05. If I do 10 tests, my alpha is 0 0.005, right? Can I do that? Okay. So meaning that you know if I do 10 tests, my each alpha is 0.5%. If I do one test, my alpha, my alpha is 5%. So if I do 10 tests, then each test I use a much lower threshold. So that so that together, the 10 tests together still give me 5% error return. So basically, I control the overall error of all my tests, rather than rather than using the same threshold for each test. So that's the idea behind the Bonferroni correction. Okay. Now, uh, unfortunately, Bonferroni is a what? Is a first of all, Bonferroni is is very strict, because it assumes that each test is independent. So it give you uh, so so this alpha may be too strict in a sense. The second of all, it's proposed by some and you know, Bonferroni correction is proposed by very idealistic statisticians who think the world should work this way. Okay, people should use Bonferroni correction when they do multiple tests. 
but in reality, people just ignore that, okay? So in reality, unfortunately, many people do a lot of different tests, and they don't, re they don't really correct for anything. Because why? Because they can get away with it, okay? They do different tests, significant, they publish, nobody really asks questions, okay? So that's unfortunate, but that's a problem that you should understand, right? Now, I'll just give you more examples about why that's bad, you know, how bad it is. Uh, you know, this is a cartoon by SKCD, which is, you know, one of the, which is a really great cartoon. Uh, then the, uh, so, th so they have this cartoon about a hypothesis test about p-value, right? So some guys, some people are going to do a study on whether jelly bean will cause agony, acne, okay? Right, just, you know, you chill over with right? You know, that's, that's the idea. So if you, if you eat jelly bean, does it give you acne? That's the, that's the research here. Um, so they run a regression. They say, okay, jelly bean has no effect on acne. Okay, so P is larger than 5%. So what can we do? Do we give up the research? No. We, we divide jelly beans into many different colors. So we're going to look at whether, whether a gray jelly bean, uh, you know, green jelly bean, you know, uh, beige jelly bean, black jelly bean, you know, you know, all kinds of different color jelly beans, we're going to run a different regression and see which one is significant, all right? And a boom, okay? We find the green jelly bean is significant. All the other things are not significant. So next day, the newspaper says, research finds green jelly bean linked to acne with 90%, 5% confidence level, right? Okay? So that's, you know, that's one example of uh, uh, this specification search. There's another term called a fission. Fission for significance, right? You're fission, okay? You try all kinds of different things. You just want to get one. Uh, this, is a, this is another interesting published research. The author fully acknowledged the, the harmful effect or fission for p-value, okay, fission for significance. Try many different things. So what this author does is he published this article to show why it's such a bad idea to do many, many different, you know, specifications, many different tests just to find the significance. So what he's doing is he look at salmon, okay, so this is salmon, um, and, and you can give salmon some kind of stimulus, okay, so you can, for example, you can play some TV in front of a salmon. And you see whether, and then you do a brain scan, okay, neural image scan, brain scan, to scan the brain of the salmon to see if there's anything that's respond to the TV signal that you give, okay? Now, in the brain, there are many, many regions, okay? There are many, many regions in the brain. So what you can do if you, if you really want to get significant results is you look at, look at the correlation by each region, okay? So each region, you look at the correlation whether there's any response. So, because each region, there's a, there's a difference, right? Pre-TV pre scan and after TV scan, there's going to be some difference. The question is whether the difference is significant or not. If it is significant, you, you say, okay, the salmon has some reaction, all right? But the thing is, you can do this for every region in the brain, location in the brain, with many, many locations. So you're essentially, you're doing many, many different tests at the same time. And ultimately, you're going to get one significant result, at least. So that's what this guy says, okay? He finds this one location that is significant. And he says, okay, can I publish a result saying that the salmon actually responds to TV signal? No, because why? Because I know for sure that the salmon is not reacting. Why? Because it's a dead salmon. Okay, he actually used a dead one, not a live one. So, you know, he intentionally does this just to show you that doing many, many different tests is a bad idea just for, to get one significant result. Okay? All right. Now, um, Sometimes, sometimes the uh, specific specification search is very obvious that you can even tell yourself, right? So if you see a newspaper journal that says green jelly beans linked to acne, you immediately think there's something wrong with the research because why, why so specific? Why only green, right? So you can, you can sort of guess that the, the person behind the research is doing some kind of okay, specification search, right? But other times, it's not so obvious. And other times, the author, even the author himself may not really know that he's doing a lot of these specifications to search, right? It's, it's not that obvious. So, for example, okay, right? Because one thing that specification search can do is not just to try to run many different regressions. The other, the other thing you can do is try to change the data yourself, okay? Change the definition of variable max. Change the, right, so let me, So for example, um, suppose I run a regression of y equal to beta x, it's not significant. What I do is, okay, I introduce beta 1x, 
Uh, so, I, I, so I do this for male, right? So what I can do is do this for male, and I do this for female, right? I do this for female, I can do this. Suppose it's still not significant. Then what I can do, well, I can change the definition of male. Okay? So for example, I can change into, uh, suppose my male is from age zero to whatever, okay? In my data sample. I can throw away what? I can throw away people be, be below 18 years old, right? So I can define my male to be only people from 18 to let's say 16, okay? Right? And I can try this again, right? You can still call it male, right? You don't have to call it old male, young male. It's still male, it's 18 to 16. I just throw away, I just throw away data and nobody will notice. And I do this again, see if it's significant, okay? So many times you not only have, can do many different regressions as a way to search for significance, you can also change your definitions, you can do many things to your data to search for significance. Uh, so here's, a, here's, a, here's an interesting paper, published again by some psychologist. Um, and this, this paper says the fluctuating female vote, politics, religion, and the ovulatory cycle. So the idea is this person collects a lot of data on people, uh, on women, uh, during the 2012 American US election, uh, the, the election between Obama and uh, Romney for the President of the United States in 2012. And the pers this paper analyzes whether female vote, okay, whether the, the, the way that women vote is influenced by whether they are in during the ovulatory cycle, okay? They're in the ovulation window. For guys who don't know what ovulation is, you can check your dictionary, okay? But anyway, for every, every month, there's about six day window than during which woman ovulates, all right? So, the, so this person looks at whether if a woman is during the six day ovulation window, does she, is she more likely to vote for Obama? Or is she more likely to vote for Romney? And uh, the paper says they find a significant effect that woman during ovulation, single woman, single woman who is ovulating vote for Obama. And, uh, you know, and, and, and women who are, met, who are not single ovulating has no effect, okay? So ovulation only has the effect on single woman and it will cause the woman to vote for Obama. That is the result of the paper, right? So, the, and, and they, they, say the, they say they have a pretty good sample, okay? 270, you know, 300 women. That's not really big, but that's already big for psychology, or right, anyway. So they are, they are doing this study and seems like the result is legit, okay? Now this is their description. So if you go to the, if you go to the paper, you go to introduction, Nothing. You go to uh, you go to abstract introduction methodology, right? There's no detail until you get to a section called the data, and then they give the detail on how they do their research. So they select 275 women with age uh, from 18 to 44, okay, and uh, who had regular menstrual cycles from 25 to 35 days, and they're going to define. So this is how they do. They define women. They, they divide women into several groups. There is a woman called a high fertility group, which cycle is from seven to fourteen. Low fertility group, okay, seventeen to twenty-five. And then they say we throw away. Okay, we throw away women on cycle days fifteen and sixteen. Why they don't say? Okay, and uh, and we did not we did not include a woman at the beginning of the cycle from the one to six or at the end of the cycle twenty-six to twenty-eight. Why one to six? Why twenty-six to twenty-eight? Okay, no explanation. Religious status, because they look at women single versus non-single, right? They look at single versus non-single woman. By the way, you can look at women in many, many, right? You can, look, you can look at women by religion. You can look at women by location. You can look at, look at women by, even by different age within this, right? You can look at all kinds of women, whether ovulatory cycle, whether ovulation affects their voting. Why do they only look at single versus non-single? Right? Think about that, right? Why do they end up only looking at single versus non-single? Maybe because that's because they tried all everything else. Nothing significant. So only this, <laughs> right? And also, but even this, even this, they have a strange definition of single. So single, so if you are engaged, if you're living with a partner, okay, if all you're married, you're not single. Otherwise you're single. So that's weird because typically people do married versus non-married, right? People look at marriage status, married versus non-married. They do not look at married versus non-married. They look at single versus non-single. So that if you are living with somebody, if you have a partner, that's also called a non-single, okay? Uh, why? Why do they make this choice, right? So everything, so if you look at the detail, you ask many questions. Why do they do this? Why do they do that? And if any of this is conscious effort to get something significant, or is it just unconscious, meaning 
they just follow whatever practice people do in the, in the literature, right? Because sometimes people just follow other people, right? Other people do this, do, uh, other people do this to the data, let me follow that. Sometimes people do this intentionally in order to get something taken significant. Um, so this is what I, what I love about Gelman. Right? So I told you about Gelman, the uh, Andrew Gelman at Columbia, he's a stat guy, he hates psychology. So his mission is to destroy psychology. So he goes out, he goes out, he asks the, the authors, and, and, you know, and also he's tenured, so he has all the time he's in the world to do whatever he wants. So he goes out and asks for data from the authors, and he does this thing, okay? So this is what he does. He's going to change, so he takes the data from the author. He says, let me change this, okay? Let me change the definition of single, okay? Because there are many, many different ways to define single versus non-single, or married versus non-married. Let me change this. Or let me change the definition of fertility, okay? How you divide the cycle into high fertility, low fertility, or how you decide to throw away things, okay? Or let me change, for example, whether, uh, you know, let me include people who not only have regular, but also have irregular menstrual cycles. So let me include, so there's many things I can do to change their, their, you know, their definition of data, okay? So he tried 168 different possibilities of changing the definition of data of changing who to include, who not to include, or you know, how to define fertility and relationship. So he tested 168 different possibilities. Guess what? All these are not significant, okay? So this is confidence interval. All these possibilities of, of defining the data has confidence, confidence interval including zero, meaning they are not significant. Only like 2% of the time do you get significance. So the definition used by the author is the, this is, the, this is the possibility used by the author. If the author just changed a little bit definition, just change single versus non-single, or change anything related to their method, they get non-significance, okay? You know, which means that this research is what? Is probably, is probably pretty bad, right? Okay? Um, all right, and indeed, um, you know, there are people who, in 2016, when Hillary Clinton versus Romney, uh, the, uh, when, when, they, when Hillary Clinton versus Romney, you know, when they had the campaign, uh, these people do a research again using the same specification from the last author, because the last author said, um, said not, it, it, no, the, the author didn't say people vote for Obama when they're, when they're ovulating. They said girls, when they're ovulating, they, had, they become more progressive. They, they vote for Democrats, okay? So then these people do a test again, see whether people ovulate, when they ovulate, they vote for Hillary Clinton, and of course the answer is, you know, this. No significance whatsoever. Okay, so again, these kind of research are not reliable, and you, you know, it takes a lot of training for you to be able to discover this kind of thing, right? So you need, you know, you need to learn that to look at the title, to look at what the people do, to look in detail at how people process their data, to see there if there's any trace of this person, okay, doing a lot of specification search in in order to get significant results. Okay, all right. Um, the data summary. Now, uh, what I just described is called a specification search. It's also called uh, p-hacking, you know, fission for significance, all these kind of names. But in general, p-hacking or specification search belongs to a practice called data snooping. So data snooping is a more general idea. The idea of data snooping is very simple. Actually, I already discussed last time, which is if you choose your model based on how the training data looks like, your result is not going to generalize very well. Okay? So that's the, that's the big idea of data snooping. Specification search is just one of the manifestations of data snooping. So the idea of data snooping is, remember this is the same idea we, I, when I discuss VC dimension and VC generalization, right? So if, I have only, so if I only have a single hypothesis, then the VC bound is very tight. So E and E out are very close. But if I choose pick my hypothesis from a very large set, then the resulting, you know, the optimal hypothesis I choose based on the training data is going to generalize more poorly to E out, okay, to out of sample error. Same idea here. If you look at the data first and pick your model to fit the data, then you are essentially what? You are essentially choosing your hypothesis from a much larger set, a set containing many different models that you think do not fit the data. Okay, so your result will be fitting, you know, result will generalize much worse uh, than if you close your eyes, do not look at the data, and uh, pick a model beforehand, okay? So the recommended practice is to not look at the data, okay? Think, not look at your particular data set, 
just based on your understanding of the problem, choose a model first, and then go out, get the data, and then do your test and see if it's significant. If you do that, then the results will, what, will be more reliable, okay? Will be general as well. If you look at the data first and then pick a model to fit it specifically, it's not going to generalize particularly well. Just like when people are doing specific research. When they're doing specific research, you're really trying one model, two model, three model, four model, until you get significance. When you're doing that, you're really trying to tune your model to the data you have, and that's a bad idea. Now, data snooping in real, so this is theory. In reality, data snooping is very hard to avoid. Okay, it's very hard to avoid because, you know, many times you even do this unconsciously, okay? So suppose you just take a look. You don't, you don't run any model yourself. You just take a look at the data, okay? Now, before looking at this data, so these are, these are you know, the goal is to separate uh, the red from the blue, okay? There are two different classes. Now, before looking at the data, you may say, okay, I want to try a linear model. See if a linear model can separate the blue from the, from the red. After looking at the model, you say, okay, a linear model is not going to work. I need something like this. Right. And when you say this, you are not you haven't you have not run any model yet. You are just doing the what? The eye test, okay? So this is called eye test. You look at it, you say, okay, I'm going to try this model. So then you use this model to fit the data, it fits very well. How well does your result generalize? It's probably not that well. Because why? Because it's a result of you looking at the data, even without running, okay? Even if you don't run anything, just because you have you have look at the data and you consciously pick the model to fit the particular data set, it's going to give you a worse generalization result than if you do not look at the data, all right? Okay, so that's why um, I said, uh, you know, in one of my previous lectures, the idea in the, the accepted, widely accepted practice in biology, for example, right, uh, in, you know, in, in life sciences, is that you should pre-register your experiment. By pre-register your study, it means you tell people what are the models I'm going to run before you go out and do the experiment, okay? And then you get, you know, get the funding, you get the project, you go out and do your experiment, generate data, but then you cannot really look at the data and change your method because you have already pre-registered your method. But that's only for experimental science. In, in economics, we don't have the luxury of doing experiments in most cases. So we cannot do this, okay? We cannot do pre-register. But the underlying idea holds that the more you try to fit your model to your data, the worse your result is, the, the less reliable your, your result is. Um, okay. Now that brings us to the idea of adaptive data analysis, which is a problem facing economics in particular. The, the adaptive data analysis means uh, sometimes you choose your model before looking at your data. However, okay, you have not looked at the data, but what you have done is you have read other people's research. And others research, other people's research are based on the same data set. Okay, so imagine we're, we, we just have this data set. So some people have already looked at this data, done some research, and find that, okay, this model fits very well. And you are going to do some research on the same data. You're going to say, okay, I'm going to, now I'm going to do some new methodology that, that, that you know, improve on that person. Would you go and try a linear model? No, okay, that person already tried this kind of model you are going to make it more complicated, okay? So you're going to try some new fancy method and to fit it, fit it better. Now you say, I didn't choose my model after looking at the data. I choose my model before looking at the data. Well, you're still choosing a model based on other people's research who is, which is based on the data. So your results do not generalize very well in the end. Now that's a problem particularly facing what? Facing subjects, scientific disciplines like economics, which do not do experiments. So imagine why, you know, why physics and chemistry is so successful. Part of the reason is because, why? Because they, first of all, the, uh, in physics, people who do experiments and people who do theory are completely separate. So people who, you know, people have theorists like uh, uh, you know, Einstein, you know, there's uh, Newton and all the uh, quantum physicists, right? All these people, they develop their model. So the experimentalists, they just take their model and do some experiment to test the model. In other words, they do not look at the data and think about model, right? So that's, that's number one. Number two, number two, they, they constantly generate new, new, uh, new data by doing new experiments, okay? But in economics, we constantly what? We constantly use the same data set over and over and over again because we don't do experiments and we only have these publicly available data sets, right? So now, uh, I don't know if the TA 
over the weekend uh, told you about some of the more commonly used Chinese micro data sets, which I put in my GitHub. Okay, you can take a look. There's a list of China commonly used micro economic data sets you can use to do analysis. It's on GitHub, right? Now, the, the problem with that is all these available micro economic data sets have just been used by you know, hundreds of thousands of people over and over and over again. So if you, as long as you have read some research, you have some idea about how to describe the data, and you pick your model based on that, and your result is not going to generalize very well. So that's a particular problem facing economics, and part of the reason why economics has not been able to generate very robust, okay, very reliable findings is because we're constantly using the same data set and, and, you know, and using methods based on before, so we're constantly fitting the same thing, which is not going to generalize very well. Okay? Uh, so that is the sort of, you know, the big message in the end. Okay. All right. So that's it. That's uh, all I want to say about uh, p-values and the common problems facing uh, analysis based on p-values. We are ready to begin our next lecture, okay? But before beginning our next lecture, let me just say that um, I have finished, uh, so we have finished regression and p-value, right? But I'm going to combine them into one lecture, meaning that there's only one homework for these two. And the next homework will be due two weeks from now, okay? So next, next Sunday, okay? Sorry, next Sunday, okay? This Sunday, next Sunday, we have two weeks. Uh, you can write anything in this lecture and this lecture. Regression and the p-value. You can write anything about it. Um, okay. All right. Yeah. Sure. Data. Data. Yeah. So I, I am confused that how we can generate the data without knowing S and R. If if you say that this thing is strong, then there are many publications are available in which we compare the test to different types of test statistics uh, on the basis of p value uh, yeah. by assuming that our S and R is true and generate the data from some given distribution. Uh -huh. So I, so. I'm not. I'm actually. Sh I'm not actually sure. I understand completely your question, but you're saying that there are many studies who based on p-value. Yeah, yeah. And let's say, uh, let's say I take, I take two type of tests, F, F test and some other, sure. test, other test. Right. So I assume that. So all these tests, whether t-test, f-test, they're all conditional on which zero input, which yeah. zero is true, yeah. and you calculate whether you calculate f-test, okay, t-test. Mm -hmm. It's all conditional on which zero being true. But that's the problem, right? That's the problem I said, which is what you want is actually the conditional data, what is the probability of H0 being true? Not the reverse, but almost every statistic is conditional H0 being true and a test of statistics. So yeah. it means that if we say that this thing is not true, it then, yeah. then means that whole statistic is wrong. No, 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 no. So that's what I, uh, what I actually said last time. This is the inherent, so this is called what? This is called hypothesis testing, right? Right? It's called a hypothesis, hypothesis testing. And this is only done, hypothesis testing is only done in frequent statistics. So what I, it's not the whole statistics is wrong. It's an inherent limitation of frequentist approach. Okay? It's an inherent limitation of frequentist approach. The, fundamentally, what we're doing here is according to the, frequ, well, fundamentally what the frequentist research approach is about is trying to draw a conclusion from a single data set. So frequent this way does not allow you to incorporate your previous prior knowledge or previous belief. You have to you have to make a judgment about whether H0 is true or not based on a single data set. That's the inherent limitation of frequency. There's no way to there's no way going around it. If you want to incorporate your prior belief, you have to do Bayesian. Okay? So that's that's what we said last time. Alright? Now the again, 
think about the think about the research where uh, you know this psychologist at Cornell he did about people sensing the future, right? He has this single data set where some students, 53% of students, are able to predict you know the, where the future picture comes up, right? That's 53% versus 47%. It's the st statistically significant. Now, do you form the conclusion that people can sense the future based on this single data set? That's the question. The frequentest way is, well, that's all the data you have, so let's form a conclusion. And the conclusion is, because it's significant, yeah, people can sense the future, and let me publish it. That's the frequentest, frequentest of the behavior, right? The Bayesian behavior is, well, I have to take in, into consideration my prior. My prior being what? My prior being, all you know, thousands of years of human civilization, we have known that we cannot sense the future. Okay, and this prior is very, very strong. I know people cannot do that. So if I take consideration my into consideration my prior, then I should I should not basically I should not form my judgment. I should not basically conclude that people can sense the future based simply on the single data set. Right, the single data set should just make me maybe a little bit. You know, maybe you know, maybe there's a slight poss possibility that people can sense the future. I, I, my mind changes a tiny, tiny little bit. It's not going to m be strong enough to, to make me form the conclusion that we can sense the future. That's the Bayesian way. Because that's the difference between Bayesian and frequentist way. Right? So like I said, you know, if you use the frequentist way, even if beta star is true, so even if beta star is equal to zero, or h zero is true, you get significance 5% of the time, just by chance. And this is probably why you know, the guy got 53% of students sensing the future and published the results. Okay, so that's, that's the idea, yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, you have a, 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 a uh, 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 data card set. Yeah. So you have done a regression line and found that this is not significant and yeah. include another variable and found that this is significant. Yeah. So can you say that uh, including the control variables in the regression is also yeah, that's what that's what people do. That's what people do, man. I mean, they, you know, they try they try one model. It doesn't work. I I put a control variable into it. It's significant, it's significant. Let me publish it. Right? That's what people do. You know, the, the male female is like a control variable. Okay. So I run I run y equal to beta x, and it's not significant. I run it for male. I run it for female. That's so the male female is like a control variable, right? Okay. So if y equal to beta x, if I run it for male versus female, I'm basically doing the interaction of x with the gender, right? With the gender variable. So it's like I'm including this gender variable as a control variable into it. Okay, you know, that's, uh, that's what people do. People try different control variables, see. So some control variables are very well motivated by theory. So that's the key. When you read people's research or when you, when you listen to people's presentation, your way of judging is, okay, is this control variable that I would use without looking at the data? Okay. Without looking at the data, without doing the problem myself, is this a control variable I would use myself? Is this control variable motivated by theory that we should put it here? Or this control variable looks really kind of, you know, why is it there, okay? Why is it there? Now if, you, if your question is why is it there, it's probably because that person has done a lot of different specifications and I find out only this one works significantly. And that's a bad sign, okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So let us go to our next topic, all right?